We're going to try and take you through a half an hour whirlwind guitar tour of transforming the real learning experience. And um, it's just, I'm assuming that you were tempted to come to our talk because this was in the guide. It's saying that actually you can't go to a learning conference today without hearing suppliers evangelizing about their latest learning innovation or user interface. But despite all the innovation, the experience for most corporate learners is still poor. And the bigger question for us all is, what the can we do? Because it's a big problem. So these are some of the things I'm going to cover. But I'm going to spend time talking about what makes a compelling learning technology. And what I want to do is actually get you all to raise a hand, because I want to see if your bodies are functioning this morning. So if you could raise your right hand, and I need to see everybody's right hand. I can see if you're not raising your right hand. It's pretty easy to see. Please keep your right hand up. I know it's a little bit of a stretch. Now, could you keep your right hand up if you love your digital learning in your organization? If you get out of the bed in the morning and think, I really want to, and I love my digital learning, could you please keep your right hand up? OK, so we got one, two, three, four, five. Obvious. <laughs> now, you may put your hands down. Thank you very much. For those who had their hands up at the end, you should have been keeping an eye on them, because those are the people that you need to be talking to. So uh, you may want to put your hands up again if you love your digital learning, just so people can see you where you are. OK, there's a few. You might want to speak to them. But for the rest of us, it is an issue that we don't love our digital learning. And I think that's a massive problem for our, our, our organization. I think that's a, and actually the industry as a whole. And what I want to explore is some of the things that why that is. What is it about the digital learning experience that doesn't, that doesn't really work? And whether your experience is actually reflect what happens elsewhere. We did our second year of research with the guys who organized this event, Learning Technologies. We've had over 1,000 respondents for the second year. And some of the things that they told us about customer expect, learner expectation was in our survey. And the things that they told us about digital learning was that it's not necessarily very good. And unfortunately, maybe the colors don't stand out, but we've got dark green here for very good. We have a medium green here, which is good. Then we have acceptable, which is this sort of yellowy color along here. And then we have poor. The gray line in the middle is 50%. Yeah, that's the halfway point. So for most organizations around learning content around digital learning content, video content, mobile learning. They're getting a good experience. But for the vast majority, they're not getting a great experience. And I'm not sure if that's reflective of your experience, but I assume it is because we've had a 1,000 respondents. On the learning platform side, it is also not necessarily great news. So at the top, we have learning systems. Down here, we have portals. And as we go further down, we have things like analytics. Analytics, social learning, LMS, MOOCs, mobile learning portals. Again, the green bit up to here is good. This is acceptable. And this is poor. Now, one thing I'm curious about is how good is acceptable? If somebody brings you an acceptable dinner tonight, is that good enough? No. <laughs> would you prefer for it to be good or very good? If you're cooking it yourself, would you go, you know, I'm really going to cook myself an exception, well, a really acceptable lunch this afternoon. I don't think you ever do. Maybe you do, maybe you're in a, a rush, but most of us have higher ambitions than being acceptable. Some of us don't. Maybe I try to, but it's not necessarily a great story. And when we talk about just the learner expectations across the different systems, and I'm trying to say this is not just about platforms. We look at learning content, being acceptable. Actually, it's nice to side on the uh, positive, but we've got these sort of always, frequently, occasionally, never. You can see from the red bits where it's not so strong. So there is a, almost an endemic uh, pattern in the learning technologies arena that isn't necessarily great. And I think that's a big concern and probably something that will phase you as you go around the arena talking to different suppliers. So for me, one of the interesting things is what really influences satisfaction with digital learning. And there are a few critical drivers. 
that you've reported back to us in the survey. And some of these shouldn't necessarily be that unexpected. But top of the list is usability, quality of end user experience. That comes in a, a six, 60, well, almost 60%, 57%. The ability of learning to deliver engaging learning experiences. Now, I was shocked when I saw that in the listing of critical drivers. So this is the critical drivers for satisfaction with digital learning platforms. I would have thought that 50%, just under 50%, was not necessarily a target layer. I'd have thought 100% would be the target for ability to drive engaging learning experiences. But what we're hearing from the survey that you guys have filled out for us is that your expectations aren't that great about the learning experience. So whilst quite often we talk to providers and beat them up about what they're doing, it's your demands as buyers which also sets the bar for what they will give you. And that's a really important thing to be aware of. You can't just follow the herd, you can't just follow the pack. You need to know what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve. Other things in here which are quite interesting, the expertise of your provider, the ability to deliver learning impact, quality of partnering support. But one, again, one thing that really shocked me is this item at the bottom that says learner engagement features. So features that would make my learners engaged with the platform are really lowly rated. Only 40% say they're a critical driver. And I think, again, it just illustrates the, the depth of passion and expectation that we have in the marketplace for delivering a great learner experience. If you want to create a really real learning experience, I think we need to actually raise our expectations. So if so many digital learning solutions are failing to deliver experiences or really improve, what can we try to do? I think one of the interesting things, maybe the first question to ask is, does UX and UI help? Now, again, maybe a, a general question for you guys is, how much do you think the UX and UI of a system, how important is that in terms of when you're looking at buying solutions? Is it very important, moderately important, or not important at all? So, and I'd like to see a show of hands again. So is it really important, moderately important, not important at all? OK, so I think. There is a belief that actually the UX is really important, and I don't disagree with that. I think we just do have consumer-grade expectations, and if you go around practically every stand, every supplier is starting to look at how they create a more consumerized experience and a richer interface, something engages their learners much more readily, and actually is comparable to the sorts of things that they see in their homework, in their home life. Some of the interesting things, I suppose, in terms of the demand for technology that we're seeing already is a shift in some of that experience in some of the content areas. So we're seeing a shift towards video. We're seeing a shift towards mobile. We're seeing even a continued shift towards blended learning and also to user-generated content. And what's interesting is about those are the top, I suppose, four themes. And they've been the same four themes in a slightly different order from last year as well. So when you're looking at the user experience, these are the things that you are looking at pretty much on the stands around us. These are part of that grade of experience. And for many providers who do not handle video well, who do not handle mobile well, they are, to some extent, relegating themselves to the second league in solutions for in terms of what you'll be looking to buy. One of the interesting ones at the bottom there is this focus on user-generated content. I think that's a, a major shift. Just again, to get a quick straw poll, poll, how many people are using user-generated content in their learning strategy at the moment? If you can put your hand up a little bit higher. OK, so we've got a fair sm smattering. Uh, it's an emerging area, thank you. But it's something that's growing. And again, that's a feature of many of the platforms and the systems and the technologies that people are looking to build into that user experience. Because it's not just about the UX. It's about the tools and it, where it's available. So Google, a few years ago, talked about a uh, continuous mobile experience, being able to start a transaction on your mobile phone and then move to your tablet and finish it off in the same process on your desktop. And that sort of sense of behavior is pervading most of the systems now. There is a continuity between the different elements and the different systems. On the platform side, the five areas of top demand are around learner engagement, 
which I think is really fascinating because again, I'm not sure what necessarily learner engagement means to you. And maybe that's something that we need to explore and define a little bit more over time. But not many of the systems, again, that you go around and look at will have features that are managed to create a learning relationship or an individual relationship with individual learners. So what I'm thinking about is, for example, if you go online and you start to do online shopping, those online shops will start to think about how they can create a relationship with you to increase your consumption of their products. They will market you based on the profiling activities that you've done, which match other people who successfully buy and upsell other materials, other solutions, other products from their, their shop. And they will approach you in that way. That's something we don't really see in systems at the moment. Some of that is driven by changes in what's typically called big data. And that's starting to come. But most of the learning solutions that we see are not focusing on how to use big data to create a stronger learner relationship. What they're looking to do is find ways of using learning analytics for your admin teams and for you to influence people about what's happening, rather than start creating that dynamic relationship which says, do you know what? I know it's six months since you bought that part for your bike. It usually wears out in eight months. You should be looking to buy a new one now. And that's what the intelligent um, shopping centers are doing online. That's what we should be thinking about with our learning systems online, thinking much more about campaign-based learning. Again, not many actually deliver that at the moment. And that's, in my view, part of the rich side of the learning experience, is how we get and touch people, hopefully in their hearts, to come back for more, rather than something being acceptable and looking nice on screen. We need to try and create that fundamental relationship and create a, a desire around us to provide learning that people love, and maybe that's an extreme view, but I think that's a really good stretch goal that we should be approaching. So, in my view, with all those great innovations, it's not just about the technology, okay? You can implement all of those things and still not have a great learning experience. Again, I want to do a little straw poll. Could you put your hand up if you have a qualification in education? Okay. Do you have a master's in education? Do you have a PhD in education? Okay, there is a straw core of people with the right skills to maximize the impact of learning and designing great learning experiences. But more broadly, there is insufficient skills within the learning arena to drive the sorts of experiences that we should be trying to construct. And that's something as a profession that we need to address. And that's not something necessarily the vendors can do for us, but we need to raise our game around that. And I don't know whether this chimp is writing another of Shakespeare's great plays. I really don't know. He could be, but it's more unlikely. And I think, I'm not saying that you guys are that far back in the evolution of his chain. I don't want to upset you that much. But I think we need to look back at ourselves and think, if we want to deliver great learning, do we have the skills to do that internally? Because it's easy to look to the solutions to provide that, but if we're not constructing them, then that's not, that's not going to happen. But the problem with learning is it is incredibly complex. We typically talk about learning as having two grand focuses. You have this really fast cog, this really fast small wheel that's flying around, which is around operational learning. It happens on a three week to six week, maybe to eight week scale. It's about new systems, it's about new starters, it's about um, new products that you're launching. Those have fixed headlines, and you need to get those out the door quickly. It's about survival of your business today. We also think about this grander, more talent-focused scheme, which is about, so what learning do I need to deliver in my organization so that it survives and thrives in two years' time, when the marketplace has changed, and we needed to develop a new product which has new materials that we'd never explored before, because that's the way the marketplace overall is moving. And we have these two things as a learning department that often we're trying to struggle with, and I think the interesting thing about the learner experience is it needs to touch both areas. Quite often we're focused on some performance related elements. Sometimes we're focused on delivering the new product, but the range of interventions that we need to be able to supply is growing broader and broader and broader and something that we need to address. And, that, and that's the problem for us, I think, is actually learning is incredibly complex. But also the ecosystems that we're trying to build are also incredibly complex because we're trying to build Formal learning, we're trying to build in elements of collaboration, we're trying to bring in workplace learning, 
We're expecting systems and solutions to operate in all those areas. And again, if you're trying to find one solution that does it all, it's very, very hard. And do they do it all well? It's really tough as well. So your ability to find good partners who work together to fit an ecosystem that puts the learner at the start. And this is just one example. Um, I'm not saying this is a recommended layout, but you want to find out what your own drivers are for your own business. But again, this is showing the challenge of trying to build a coherent ecosystem is not just about finding one partner, one experience, it's about joining many. And again, that makes it harder for you guys. I'm not saying it's going to be an easy journey. So with all this complexity, the strategic learning, the tactical learning, the different ways you want people to learn, how can we create a framework that enables you to help facilitate that? Um, one of the things that we've been trying to get people to think about and consider is what we've been talking about as a learning cycle. Now, Cole did his learning cycle. But it's very academic. What I've been trying to think about, and you could create your own. This is not me trying to say this is why. It's one example. I'd love to get feedback to say, well, I think we should do it this way. And that's something I'd be happy to exchange with you on an ongoing basis. I'd like us to build this more, is a, a sense of a learning cycle. We've come up with an idea of uh, plasma learning. Now, I don't know if you know the four states of matter. Anybody remotely scientific understand what the four states of matter are? No? I need a bit of feedback. You do, yeah? So can you give me one? A gas. Great example. Anybody else got another one? I'll come back to you, sir. A liquid. Anybody else got one? Solid. And plasma. Now, does anybody know what is the most significant plasma in your life today? Sorry? I heard it. Somebody said the sun. The sun is a plasma. It's energizing, it gives us life. Without it, nothing would exist. And that's why I want, I'm labeling this a little bit because there's, there is a method in the madness. We want to drive people's energy through the learning process. And plasma is that sort of sense of energy. And I think that's what we should be doing in terms of we want to drive love for learning. We need to energize our process and our thinking around it. So plan is what I need to know. What do I need to be able to do? Simple. Learn is actually, how do you acquire that? I and mean, there's so many choices, so many choices around here about how you can do that online, offline, synchronous, asynchronous, a range of opportunities. Apply is something that we very rarely do when we work in a learning department. We tend to say, we're giving you the training. Was it any good? You liked it, good, bye-bye. But actually, for most of us, the application of our learning is the critical part. And, I, and that can happen in a microsecond, it can happen in over a three-week period. An example being, if the bulb goes in my car, I've got an Alfa Romeo, it goes regularly. Um, if I don't know how to change it, the first thing that I might do is maybe look at Google. And I will look at Google and see, how do you get your hand in to undo the clip, to remove the back, to put the, pull the bulb out, to take it out, to put the new bulb in, put it in. That's me trying to respond to a learning need quickly. But the application, I don't switch off and say, OK, I've watched the video. I've still got a broken lamp. I've got to put the new bulb in. And if, it, if I don't manage to put it in successfully, then I might go and look at another video. I might ring up a mate, or I might have to take it to an expert to get it fixed. And that's the learning cycle that I think we pretty much go through on a regular basis. We think about, do we need to sustain it? How do we measure if we're on and off target? How do we analyze it? Now, the reason I put this up is, I think by thinking about things as a learning cycle, what we can do is intelligent think, think about how we connect the technology into the problem or support the cycle rather than thinking we can bring the technology and try and do something. Quite often, I think when we think about the link technology is we put the car and then we try and work out where the horse should go behind it. What we should be doing is thinking about what experiences we want to create and use the technologies that deliver that experience rather than actually I've got an average experience from delivering it through this e-learning product. So, the sorts of things that you can do if you think about the learning cycle and how technology can help. Diagnostics. Who does diagnostics when they start a learning program? A few. Now, the great things about doing diagnostics is that gives you a benchmark. That gives you a measure to say, if they've done the training, did it make any difference? 
And especially if you do 360 benchmarking, 360 feedback, you know whether people are really doing it. So that's a great start to any process. You can talk about personal development agendas, providing individual focus. All these things are part of a, a planning process. Again, very few systems will think about bringing all those elements together in a coherent way that you can manage as part of a campaign for a particular product, particular service that you're trying to deliver as a program. In terms of learn, there are so many learning choices, face-to-face, -face, virtual, and from the, all the research they've done, all of them work. Different levels of success, but they all work, and they work even more powerfully if they're blended together. And that's a given, that's in the research, that's, you can do no significant, if you type no significant difference into Google, it will bring you back all the research you ever need to know whether technology makes, it actually works. How much it makes a difference is how well you blend it together, but this sense of digital learning, any time, any place, any time, anywhere, the scale and reach, that's a given. But actually then helping people take that into their workplace to really apply it, this is part of the critical learning experience which most of the systems do not tend to look at. And how you make that come to life is by thinking about how can I encourage you to do a learning journal? I don't know, if, has anybody ever done a learning journal? Okay. If you haven't done a learning journal, look to the people who got their hands up, have a word with them about what they are. It's a self-reflection. It's something that's really worth finding out about. But this sense of having coaches and mentors and blogs and feedback as you're doing your work, based on what you've learned, usually L&D have gone on to the next project, but it's something that you really need to be involved in because that's the critical part of the learning experience. So if we want to raise the game around the learning experience, we need systems that reach out into that area as well. So things that you can do to stimulate that are things like observations or observation checklists by managers that are in time and place, encouraging peer-to-peer -peer feedback, um, encouraging communities of practice to discuss elements of continuous improvement, this is part of the learning experience and something that we often neglect because we focus so much on the technology rather than what we're trying to achieve, which is typically uh, a raise in performance, a raise in proficiency in our people. Sustain is something that, again, people don't necessarily think about, but it's something we probably need to take much more seriously, which is, so how do we get you to keep performing? Because it's easy to lapse, right? I've been on a time management course I spent two weeks managing my time. Everything then came as a really busy time, and I reverted to type. So my ability to sustain my behaviors is actually something that I need help with, and actually we all need help with. And that should be part of the learning experience that we're offering to people. So things like coaching, peer support, a great one of my favorites, after action reviews. So you've done a big project, you've done an action, you get everybody together and said, what do we do? What went well? What didn't go well? What we do different next time? This is organizational learning. And what we're hoping is that people bring the skills that we've shown them and the techniques and the knowledge to their work and use those to interpret what they're doing as well. So that's really important, but also just the just-in-time support. So all the things that actually I'd forgotten because it had been three weeks ago, I need to look it up. So the quick reference sheets, the search to find stuff, the ability to actually just type into your search engine and work and come back with a learning object rather than having to go to an LMS is something I do not understand why that doesn't happen, but it doesn't. Memory joggers, one of my favorites is knowledge shootouts. Um, certain organizations enable you to uh, challenge somebody else in your organization to answer a set of questions in a specified period of time, and the winner is the person who gets the highest score. Challenge your CEO. Challenge your manager, challenge your peers, and you get credits and ratings. So that whole sort of gamification experience. But again, trying to pit, thread these things together as an overall experience is something that you need to do and try to navigate your way through because you'd very rarely find it in one system, although I think that will come over time. And finally, where we probably should have started in the plasma model rather than where I did start is measure. Actually, measuring people's activity, their behaviors, their skills, their feedback, is something that should be foundational because without having that individual view, that individual connection, then we never have a way of creating the experience that keeps them engaged. 
So it's that personal relationship. And again, that's something that I think isn't necessarily as built into the systems as, as they should be. But some great things in here, self-assessment, quality assessment, performance metrics, manager performance assessments. One of my favorites, mystery, sh mystery shopper feedback. How many of your organizations link in their mystery shopper or their quality controls into your learning system? One, two. How are you going to make a business impact if you're not linked into business systems? It's probably one of the critical things that you need to consider if you really want to measure effectiveness. So again, trying to find, if you're navigating through platform selections, who provides the right connectors out of the box or the right systems to enable you to get to that data? Because that's something to engage your people with. When you can say your actual performance is comparable to the lowest 25% of performers who've also gone through, not gone through this course, it's a great prompt to encourage people to be engaged. It creates a burning platform under their feet that thinks, well, I can ignore it, I can go somewhere else, and maybe I can, maybe I can and do some other learning. But actually, you can push things in a much more engaged and relationship way. And I think that's something that we need to look at, creating this sense of learner relationship tools is something we don't necessarily always see. And Analyze is just trying to pull that together so you can work out what you should be doing. But it's a very simple model, really. It's like, so how do you encourage people to say, this is where I am, this is where I need to get to, these are the things that I can use to get there. And I think we very rarely think about the whole journey because we bail at the point when we said, there's the tools, goodbye. And it's important that we create that continuity and that connection all the way through. So, interesting thing. From my point of view, the real learning experience is partly in the systems, but it's mostly in the solutions that you build. And it's how you string together all of the different parts of the plasma learning cycle, because that enables you to create touch points. You can reach out to people, create elements of reward and sophistication and excitement in how you're reaching out to them as individuals, rather than necessarily just sending them through as a massive cohort. And that's something I think we need to think about more about how we profile. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have a fitness app that you use irregularly, if you like. Okay, can you put your hands up a little bit more just so people can see? The great thing about those fitness apps, I don't know, is that they nudge you to do more. I've got one that tells me when somebody's beaten me over a stretch of country lane that I cycle up every other week. I mean, you may not be able to believe that, but I do. Um, and it's fascinating to me because when I see somebody beating my time, even if they smashed me, I still want to try and get close. So I don't want to get left behind. And I think there is some deep-seated behavioral psychology that marketeers know, that those engagement apps know, that we have yet to bring to learning. And partly that's because we have not asked for it. I think as we start to ask for more of this functionality in relationship tools, actually, that's where we're going to find some really interesting breakthroughs. But you need to ask for it before these guys around us actually supply it. So. Key takeaways, because uh, I think I've come to the end of my little ditty. You cannot assess a learning experience through a functional checklist. We often see people go to market and say, does the supplier do mobile? Do they do social? Do they do user-generated content? And they have a list of maybe 500 lines of items. Yes, you will find out whether they have the functionality, what you can only assess through use case scenarios, and actually working through the system with end users, not you, is whether the experience is any good. And I would say, yes, use the functional checklist to give you a sense of qualification to make sure they can do what you want to do. But please, if you're going to make a selection of any solution, create something that you can test and pilot with your end users to see whether they find it engaging. Because if they don't, you might want to leave it to one side. OK? Describe the journey that you want to take them on. And I think what we need much more is a story of what we want the experience to be. And that's reliant on you to piece it together. You can think of how you want to join this together, whether it's very informal, whether it's very formal, whether it uses feedback, whether it doesn't. I think you need to be much more complete in how you look at joining these things together, be much more flexible. But demand that from the system in terms of support. And I think really only by demanding the sorts of experiences 
based on what we think would be really great, will we actually get the solutions that can deliver it? So it's your mission to demand digital learning that people love. Don't just accept what's there, try and make it fit, solve a problem. Stretch people with the stories and challenges that you have. Mm -hmm.